Our leader once again, Willie T. Ribs, out in front. Willie T. Ribs, his fourth victory in the Trans Am Series. We have a winner of the Texas Challenge Trans Am. If you don't want me in your sport, then beat me. My ultimate goal is IndyCar. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm here with my good friend, Willie T. Ribs. In, honestly, the purpose of this uh, broadcast today is to recognize a true hero for diversity. Uh, Willie, Willie in, in, in the honor of Black History Month, this seemed like an appropriate time to have this chat with you. You know, our history goes back. 10 years now when I first called you to come race at Indianapolis. Oh, Willie, Willie T coming back. Let's go right there. I love you. I love you, baby. You drove the shit out of me. I, I was learning as fast as I could. I, I never started the damn thing. And I still think to this day the average American or average person really doesn't understand the magnitude of your role and changing the face of our sport. There's no sport more exciting than racing. This is the next best thing to heaven. They called me uppity, and I loved it. I don't know how many people know this, Tony, but I, I grew up, I was born in the sport. My dad was racing motorcycles before I was born. He was flat track, dirt uh racer and him and joe leonard uh were were very good friends both in san jose and uh and 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 then my dad went to started racing sports cars once he got too old to ra ra race that uh, dirt bike and um that was my introduction i was going to the races almost from the time i was born and uh with my dad so you know, it, it was not uh, something that I decided when I was in high school, I didn't have a career choice and I decided I was going to be a race driver. I knew that I was going to be uh, that was going to be my career choice when I was nine years old. But also share with people what you're doing now in, in perhaps the biggest role is your current role with Formula One. Uh, your your official title is uh, for diversity inclusion ambassador for Formula One, but you uh, you know we both saw profound change when we went to the Coda races the last couple of years of seeing more people of color in the stands of any automobile race I've ever seen, and they all seem to have one thing in common: they had a Mercedes logo on. So I think our you laying the foundation for our friend Mr. Hamilton. It's really, it's really changed the sport. But first, how how much change have you seen since your early days? And you know, I watched the change from the corporate standpoint, and and the the media uh, standpoint. It just it one sort of went in lockstep with the other, and um. You know, as far as diversity is concerned, there was there was no such thing as diversity and, and inclusion, right? There was. I was lucky that I had a family that could afford to put me in a race car and send me to England. And uh, my diversity was my right foot. That's how I diversified <laughs> into the sport. And you know, I had great success in England. And uh, you know, my my beginning there, it has a lot to do with my uh, being a Formula One ambassador right now. Bernie Ecclestone and I were, were friends uh, from 1977 uh, till now. Bernie was always good to me, put me in his Formula One car in Portugal for a test. And um, so Formula One has always been, uh, always been good to Willie T. Ribs. How how difficult, Willie, when you showed up on the scene? I, I saw, obviously, I was at their screening in the original rollout of Uppity, and it really opened my eyes. Can you share the first pass, that, your first attempt didn't go swimmingly? You, you left and didn't qualify, and then you came back and ultimately made the show. Can you walk 
folks through that journey a little bit because it to see the movie was it, it raises the hair on your arm. I mean, it really was emotional. And, uh, my first uh, go there in 1985 was was really not a go. Don King uh, just signed a contract for uh, with Don King to uh, do some sponsorship work for me. And he went out and got a deal with Miller Brewing Company. I really didn't have an idea as to, um, you know, I knew who the good teams were, but all the good teams were taken. So a team was quickly put together. And uh, I knew right from the start that the crew chief who was on the team was uh, wasn't really a right the right person for me, and uh, there was no com pretty much no communication, and um, and I stepped away from it, and and I was advised to step away from it uh, by Jim Truman, and I did, and and I was crucified. The media crucified me. They and with with race a tinge of race all over it all over it he's scared he's scared no you know he's really it was questioning uh my manhood based on uh a dog whistle that had race and color all over it they know they did and if they said they didn't they're lying through their yellow teeth when I came back in 91, I, I knew more and I knew that the team that I was getting involved with was current and they were, uh, uh, Derek Walker was current. He had just left the Porsche team, the Porsche IndyCar team. He was, he was, uh, with Penske before that had a lot to do with, uh, Roger Penske's success in IndyCar. So um, I called Bill Cosby and said that Derek Walker is available. Uh, can we get a meeting? And he said, yeah. So we, Derek Walker flew to Las Vegas. I met him in Vegas. We met in Bill Cosby's dressing room. And in three hours, we did a deal. Uh, Bill asked him how much it was going to take. And Walker told him. And Bill sent him a check. Actually wired it. Two days later, Walker was speechless. He said, nobody, nobody does that. Well, Bill did, and so we were underway. But what I liked the most about Walker's team was he had an engineer named Tim Wardrop. And Wardrop had, in fact, Wardrop has been a winning engineer for Ari Leyendike and Andy. He's a brilliant guy, and he was, you could, he really communicated well and and he was smooth and he was calm and in a high pressure uh a cooker like uh, indianapolis motor speedway that's the kind of people you need around you calm and he was he was best what what moments in your mind the most important that you had or you you care about the most you know every every time i won a race you know it was it was important tony but you know you just asked the question what was the biggest accomplishment well you know indy indy 500 is was is the biggest race uh in the world biggest single race on the planet and um that might change in november when formula one uh goes to vegas However, um, then it was the the big show. And to be in there, you know, winning is on another level. To win, so much has got to happen, especially in regards to the team you're with. You've got to have the team or you're not going to win at Indy. You know, that's period. So uh, I knew what I had and what I had to work with. And getting that, what I had to work with, into the show is a year-old car. Um, we did no testing with the car prior to uh, uh, the month of May in 91. And we put a Buick engine in there. And, you know, the, the team was so good. 
they were so good that they could make um, they could make chicken salad out of chicken shit. Well, you know, sometimes you have to get to the next day to realize it. But, you know, I realized that everything went good. I, what I do realize is that my team worked really hard and Buick never gave up. They kept helping us when we were when we were sunk. I mean, we were underwater and we got resurrected. So, uh, you know, it, it, we all, it came through an end and I'm really pleased about that. It was a truly historic moment. First African-American in the Indianapolis Tell me, Willie, from your perspective, how do we change the face of race? You know, in my little world, we have a Pro Motorsports holding diversity scholarship or I'm bringing kids of color or young ladies in to try to change the face and I count their entries and we do what we can to raise the awareness for kids that don't have the money to go racing. How do we do this for scale? It seems so obvious to me with the effect Lewis Hamilton has had on Formula One and the, the spectators that follow Formula One because of him that are people of color. And he, he's really alone at, at Formula One. Um, there's only been two black drivers in the history, in history of Formula One that's ever driven uh, a Formula One car. I did it the year Lewis was born in Portugal in 19, December of 1985. Lewis has come along and become, without a doubt, if you look at all the numbers, the greatest Formula One driver ever, right? Um, the manufacturers do, who, who make billions of dollars, make billions, Ford, General Motors, uh you you can go down the line mercedes bmw they all have a responsibility you've been you've made a lot of money people of color have kept you in business so i think that they need to earmark x amount uh as a group to uh to fund programs that develop drivers of color as well. They have a responsibility. I've said it before. I don't care whether they like what I'm saying, you know. And uh, if that if that rectum tightens up when I when they hear it, you know, it's going to have to you're going to have to tighten it up because um, that's the only way it's going to happen. Tony, you can't do it all by yourself. You have to have corporate support. You've already but it, you've already um, started the ball rolling. All they have to do is help you keep the ball inflated. Who's, who's your heroes? Well, in the sport, I, I think my first hero was Jim Clark. I mean, my dad was a big fan of Jim Clark's. I was real young then. I, I saw him once uh, in Monterey Laguna Seca at a, it might have been a Can-Am race, but um yeah, I don't even think they called it Can Am back then. But you know, Jim Clark was was Fangio, of course. Graham Hill, you know, Bobby Unser became one of my and Bobby Unser, without a doubt, is my all time because of not just how great a driver was, but how he treated me. Because of all the old guard, all the old school drivers, he treated me like I was one of his his family. I'll never forget it. Now, you know, one thing that we, we probably should mention is Theo. Uh, I've been still for the last 10 years evolved into a world-class shooter. And and, and again, I, I've not been one of his competitions, but my guess is it's, it's probably not unlike what you went through when you started racing, where you were you were the one of the few people of color, if not the only person of color at the event. And shooting typically is, a, I think most people think of it as the southern part of the country. What is Theo dealing with some of the same things you dealt with coming into a, a, a white dominated sport? A lot of the media, uh, auto racing media asked me why I didn't direct Theo's career into motorsports to follow in my footsteps. I said, well, 
I had a hobby and it was clay shooting. And uh, I took him out as a little kid uh, with me to, to help me. Uh, you know, I couldn't push the buttons and shoot at the same time. So he started pushing the buttons when he was uh, about nine years old. And then he told me, he says, I don't want to push the buttons anymore. I want to shoot. So um, we, you know, got a shotgun for him. And he pretty much right away figured it out. And, you know, because shooting a shotgun well was, was like golfing. I mean, there's a lot of technique to being good at shooting uh, moving targets at varied speeds and very di varied distance. So he started and he did well. He did so well that I knew that for him to be a world-class shooter, I had to move into Texas. So we moved out here in, in 06 and he started high school and he immediately started winning in his category. So he became sub junior champion, then junior national champion, junior world champion. And then when you're 21, you become uh, open class, which is that, right? I was taking him to Europe and Dubai and, and I just watched him, uh, his determination to win. He's in Florida right now competing this weekend and next weekend. And, you know, and he's had great support. He's had great support from you. He's had great support from Chris Dyson. Uh, in fact, most of his sponsors are all people related to auto racing, <laughs> which is, uh, and uh, uh, Claudio Burt and Tommy Dreese. I mean, friends in the industry, to say, hey, you know, I like what your kid's doing and it's cheaper than racing. We'll sponsor it. So <laughs> um, it's been great support. As far as the social side of what he's doing, um, there, you know, in fact, one of his friends said, how come you and your dad are, do you guys just like making history? <laughs> you know, and no, it's what I grew up doing on the ranch with my grandfather shooting and you know, I had a great, great upbringing. My dad raced, my grandfather shot. So, um, but as far as abuse, you know, or anything uh, hostile, <laughs> no. That's the wrong sport to get hostile with, mm -hmm. with someone. <laughs> you know, you're, you're, you're really, you're really nice to each other, actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I do think, you know, honestly, I think times are improving. Certainly not. There's still way too much silly stuff that goes on in the world. But at the same token, where we are as a nation, as a people today versus the 60s and 70s, obviously, we've made progress compared to 100 years ago, huge progress. But still got a long way to go before it's a, a level playing field. But you, uh, in honor of Black History Month, it's pretty cool to call you my friend. You are, uh, you're making a difference in the world, sir. So thanks for taking the time. Say hi to Steph and Theo for me, and uh, we'll catch up soon. Yeah, uh, sooner than later. Yes, sir. Thanks. All right, T.